Hi everyone and welcome to this video about environment art and today we're going to look at how we can use blueprinting to speed up our processes. And so for this I'm using an asset pack from Lertz and if you want to get hold of this asset pack for cheap you can get access by the link in the description below. It's an affiliate link so if you click on it you are supporting the channel and if you also use the coupon code HV50 you'll get 50% off this gigantic bundle of assets. So do check it out, it can be worthwhile but if you want to use your own assets for this you're more than welcome to. So let's take a look at how we can start using environmental art in blueprinting. Okay, so in my level here, we've got some meshing and I'm gonna use a floor tile for today. And this floor tile, if we want to make a larger floor out of this, you may be thinking that you just have to do this sort of thing all over the time, okay? Now, albeit that this would work, the problem this has is it is, very inefficient for your time and also for the computer too. The reason why it's inefficient for your time is this can take some time depending on the size of the level to place out every single tile. The reason why it's inefficient for the computer is because every one of these static meshes is sort of storing information about uh, the static mesh itself. So we've got the mesh, we've got the materials, we've got stuff about the actor, we've got the LOD system, miscellaneous stuff, physics, all this stuff you see in the details panel is all information that we don't actually need. We only need to say it once and then instance it multiple times because the only thing we're changing here is the transform. So we're going to use instance static meshing and we're going to make it a system to make our floor tiles auto-generate for us. So let's go ahead and create a blueprint for our system here. And we'll call this one BP Law Gen. And in here, we're going to have an instanced static mesh. Okay. So this is a much more efficient way of displaying a static mesh on the screen. It's, if the only thing that's different between each version is just the, uh, the transform of it. And we're going to select our instance stack mesh. And over here, we can set what mesh we want it to use. So I'm going to go ahead and get my mesh from my Fantasy Dungeon pack. Take the floor tile here and drag that across. Now, even though I've got it assigned here, you'll see, you'll see nothing appears over here. So let's just go over how instance stack meshing actually works. So if you go down on the right hand side of the component, you will see the section about instances. And we can click on the add instance and it will add an instance of it. And we can add more instances and just change the transforms of those instances. So obviously it's still comparing the shaders, but we'll click on the instance then, and you can see I can move it around. Okay. So it makes it more efficient as it's just using the same data across all the instances. Uh, now, one thing is that it won't, that it does, it will share all the data. So it won't separate out the LODs. So if you've got a really large floor, you wouldn't want to do it for that because your LODs will all be in the sync and therefore you might get some performance issues there. But most of the time you'll be using this and you, it'll be a lot better. So let's remove our instances because we're going to build these out dynamically. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use a vector to draw out the size and shape of our floor. So I'm going to go to my variables and I'm going to do room vector. And this will be a vector variable. But we're going to make this instance editable and we're going to show the 3D widget. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this widget and say when it's stretched out over a certain amount of uh, space, we're going to fill that space up with these floor tiles. So let's go to my construction script. The construction script is really useful to use in the editor because it allows you to rebuild it live, which means that you can, before the game is uh, packaged and shipped you can plan out and design your environment without having to go into runtime or anything like that so really useful and in this case what we're going to do is we're going to take the room vector here and we want to basically find out the size of how many tiles we're actually going to need so we're going to take this room vector here and i'm going to break it open and i want to divide the x and y ignoring z for now it, uh, divide the x and y by 300 because that's the size of my mesh so i'll take the x here divide that by 300 and the y we're going to divide by 300 and we're going to truncate these values here so truncating basically just means that we're going to lop off 
the decimal point. We're not going to use the decimal point at all. It's just going to, so if it's 3.5, the answer will be just 3. So we're going to truncate both of them. Like that. And then we're going to store these two as uh, local variables. And we'll do this one as L. And this is the X. So we'll do width. And place that in there. And we're going to promote this one to local variable. We'll do this one as L depth. Okay, so now we've worked out how many we need to have in a two, uh, in a uh, X by Y. So now we're going to do a for loop nested inside of another for loop. So let's focus on just getting one of these working first. So let's do a for loop. And I'm going to do my last index as L width. And on the loop body, we're going to take our static mesh out and we're going to add an instance to it. Add instance. Now, what's important about this is that we have to give it a transform. So whereabouts are we adding this instance? So let's split this open. And we only care about the location for this. And what we're going to do is take the index and multiply this by 300. That's the width of our tile. Obviously, if you're working with square objects, this makes it a lot easier to do this stuff. Uh, but you can theoretically still do it without being a square. You can do it with rectangular objects too. And I'm going to put this in the transform here. We're going to split that and put that in the X there. Okay. Hit compile. So now we've just got that one. We're going to test this out. And so you can see how it works bit by bit. So let's delete these ones. We don't need these anymore. And instead, we're going to bring in our floor gen. And I'm going to click on this little diamond here. So this diamond here is the 3D widget used for our vector. And if I drag this out in the X coordinate, you can see it adding instances for us. Perfect. That's what we want. But we want it to also fill out this way too. So let's now do a nested for loop to get that direction. And this is for loop just means having another for loop inside of this one. So what we're going to do is drag out this add instance. And we'll do another for loop. Like so. Now what's important about this is that we store the indexes of these. So I'm going to take this index here. Might that to a local variable. And we'll do this one as width index. And the last index for the second for loop will be the depth. So let's put the depth in. And delete this multiply now. And then the loop body is going to go connected to our add instance. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have the X and Y locations being set on this. So I need to take the L width index, which I've got down here. Multiply this by our 300. And plug that into my location in the X. And we might as well just promote this one to local variable 2. So we've got it there. And we've got a bit of symmetry in our code. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. But with a depth and for the Y axis. File, save. So now you can see here, we can now drag out this diamond shape and generate a floor matching whatever size we want. And because it's instanced stack meshes, it's going to be a lot more efficient for us. So I can drag out this floor like so. Now, I wouldn't cover the whole world that you need to have in this. You probably want to still separate out into multiple assets um, just because you can then take advantage of the LOD system better then. Because now these are two separate things. This first floor gen is going to have a different LOD than this floor gen over here. So it's a little bit more efficient with the rendering. Plus, you can also get different shapes and sizes out of it then. Let's actually just duplicate this one. It's a lot easier, wouldn't it? But you can also rotate them like this. And if you are going to ro rotate them, make sure you're working with the, the diamond shape 
by changing this to relative space over here. So this little button up top changes it from relative to local space. So I'm just going to move this around now in a lot more useful fashion. Okay. There you go. So as you can see, using blueprints can really speed up your workflow and make it a lot more efficient for your sake as well as the computers. So don't neglect the idea of using blueprints as part of your environment art. In fact, we'll go over a few more examples in future videos too, where you can see how we can better utilize these meshes in more interesting ways. If you like this video content and you want to see more like this, head over to patreon.com forward slash Ryan Laley, where you can find all my videos early before everyone else from just $1 a month. So a massive thank you to everyone over there who are supporting the channel over on, on Patreon, as well as those on YouTube members. Thank you so much for your support. Make sure you subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye everyone.